Well, good morning and welcome to Matins. <laughs> Matins, that's what this is, on uh, this Wednesday of the second week of Epiphany. Thank you for being with me today. Uh, the scriptures we're using are Psalm 15. And we're going to finish Isaiah chapter 44. We'll catch a little bit of 45. And we'll start Ephesians chapter 5. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Would you please pray with me? Blessed Lord, you speak to us through the Holy Scriptures. Grant that we may hear, read, respect, learn, and make them our own, in such a way that the enduring benefit and comfort of the Word will help us grasp and hold the blessed hope of everlasting life given us through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship him. Alleluia. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth. The heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. O come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship him. Alleluia. All right. Psalm number 15. <clears throat> o Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a repro reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you first chose to live among us, and in returning to your Father, you made an eternal home for us. Help us walk blamelessly in your ways and bring us at last to your holy mountain, where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> hmm. All right. So our first reading is Isaiah 44. We'll start at verse 24, and we'll read to verse 7 in the next chapter. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself, who frustrates the signs of liars and makes fools of diviners, who turns wise men back and makes their knowledge foolish who confirms the word of his servant and fulfills the counsel of his messengers, who says of Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited, and the cities of Judah, they shall be built, and I will raise up their ruins, 
who says to the deep, be dry, I will dry up your rivers, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall fulfill all my purpose, saying of Jerusalem, she shall be built, and of the temple, your foundation shall be laid. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him, and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places, that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who called you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me. That people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west, there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. So the last section of chapter 44, uh, the subtitle that was uh yesterday's was the folly of idolatry right idolatry does not yield any fruit because you're praying to a piece of wood or a piece of metal they're not going to answer you <clears throat> so god reminded us who he was he is the redeemer all right so let's go back up there and catch that. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you from the womb. Life comes from God. It's not just a mix of chemicals and proteins. You can mix chemicals and proteins and not get life. God begins the definition of himself first as Redeemer, not Creator or Lord. This shows his love to his own people. I will redeem you, okay? I'll redeem you. I formed you from the womb, but first I'm your redeemer. Then I am the Lord. I made all things. I alone stretched out the heavens, spread out the earth. By... I created everything, God says. Everything. But most important is I am your redeemer. Your being Israel, okay? I did all this. I frustrate the signs of liars and make fools of diviners, turn wise men back and make their knowledge foolish. All these people who think they know th all this about the world, about creation, that don't confess God as their Lord and give credit to him for all that's out there, God will thwart their efforts. God will thwart their efforts. Pagans saw omens as supernatural backing for their words. Those would be the signs of liars. Babylonians were particularly noted for dependence on official diviners and, get this, horoscopes. Yeah. Christians do not take horoscopes seriously. They can be very entertaining. But don't count on them for wisdom or guidance. <clears throat> Verse 26, who confirms the word of his servant and fulfills the counsel of his messengers. Old Testament prophets, but ultimately his son. Okay. This, he confirms the word of his servant. Each, each prophet, like Isaiah, I'm sure, knew that this was about him, who's also a messenger. But ultimately, this is about Christ. What spokesmen proclaim in the name of him who made all things and whom the forces of nature obey will come true, whereas fortune-telling diviners will be proven to be liars, as we saw in the last verse. Okay. Who says of Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited, the cities of Judah, they shall be built, now raise up their ruins. Okay, so this is the word that is going to be fulfilled. Okay. 
who says to the deep, be dry, I will drive your rivers. Okay, so more supernatural, more power over nature, supreme power over nature. The promise is strengthened, fulfilling the rebuilding mentioned in chapter 41. Many attempts have been made to understand how the proper name Cyrus could show up in a text written 200 years before Cyrus II, the king of Persia. Some think this proves a later date for the writing of Isaiah, making it written after Cyrus II. Others think a scribe living at the time of Cyrus II inserted the proper name into the 8th century text. The name itself appears at other times in Persia. In fact, an earlier Cyrus reigned nearer the time of Isaiah, um, 646 BC. He was king in Parsua, not to be confers, confused with Persia. Attempts to explain away the text fail to understand how important the use of Cyrus's proper name is to the argument of the text itself. This is clearly a prophecy and fulfillment from God. <clears throat> people will come up with all kinds of ways. People who don't want to believe this will come up with all kinds of ways to try and discredit this. Believe it or not, the Isaiah scroll is one of the oldest documents in Jewish history. <clears throat> and the language really has not changed. Um, Ten-year-old Israeli child could read most of the Isaiah scroll. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Okay, so 45. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, king of the Persian Empire, who sent the first group of exiles from Babylonia to Judah. Okay, what he did, Babylon had conquered Israel and scattered many of the of the hebrew people okay part of this was they didn't want to just conquer a nation they wanted to wipe it out wipe out its society its culture its history and they did that by scattering the people um, forcing marriages um, to dilute bloodlines killing off royalty or um, imprisoning them when cyrus conquered babylon he freed all those people and sent them back to their homeland to, re to rebuild um, Israel as its own country and as its own nation, I should say, and, um, and to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. That's what he was a generous king. They were still going to be part of his empire, but he was going to allow them some autonomy. <clears throat> Thus says his anointed, all right, anointed. This is set apart for a special purpose, okay? That's what that means. And that is exactly what God did with Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, okay? Um, all right, let me back up. So if we're going to... We're going to, we got to, so we've already mentioned Cyrus in verse 28. He's my shepherd. He should fulfill all my purpose. Okay. The Lord shows his unrivaled status among the false gods of Babylon because he is able to predict the proper name of Cyrus before this monarch lived. The Lord can keep his promises and comfort his people, Israel. Cyrus II was king of Persia and conquered Babylon in 539 BC, calling Cyrus a shepherd brings him in line with the leaders of Israel, like Moses and David. And Cyrus was to show the kind of concern and guidance a shepherd provides for his flock. Cyrus issued a decree that allowed the Israelites to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. So there you go. All right. Now, I like this. So, the, the intro to chapter 45 in my study Bible here says, infinitely merciful and patient, God does not tire to repeat himself. Again and again, he promises to deliver his fallen creatures and goes to great lengths to persuade doubting and faint-hearted souls to believe the proclamation of their liberation. Hmm. He does not lose patience in repeating himself. 
The Lord takes hold of Cyrus's right hand, just as he did with Israel, to subdue nations before him. Right? God will open the doors, defeat kings. Um, so loosening the belts refers to a man who girded up his loins in preparation for battle and donned his weapons. It's going to make it harder for him to fight, basically. Loosening the belt would remove the weapons and make him unprepared to fight. Kings were to be deprived of power. All right, so in 539 BC, history lesson today, Cyrus surrounded the city of Babylon. The priests of Marduk submitted and declared him to be Marduk's chosen monarch. They then opened the city gates to allow him and his army to enter peacefully. Now, Jesus is the ultimate anointed one who opens the gates of hell and sets the prisoners free. See John 8, 36 for that statement. All right, I will go before you, level the exalted places. Level the mountains. Okay. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through bars of iron. Nothing will stand in God's way, in Cyrus's way, because God will take away all obstacles. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes in secret places. Uh, no. That you may know it's I, the Lord, God of Israel, who called you by your name. You, Cyrus, for a specific purpose, not just anybody, the person God chose. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen. For Israel's comfort, the Lord specifically named Cyrus, who has done nothing to earn his status in the Lord's sight. God chose him. And that's the rest of verse four there. I name you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other besides me. There is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me. God is using him. Empowering him for God's own purposes. That people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. From the rising of the sun in the east <laughs> and all the way to the west. I am the Lord. There is no other. God acts to spread the message of salvation throughout the world because he is the only God for all. I form light and create darkness. Now that is an odd statement for our God who associates himself with light. This indicates an aspect of God that the Vulgate which is the Latin Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, the Vulgate. This translates in verse 15 as the hidden God. In his hiddenness, the Lord brings judgment and destruction. But in his revealed state, he ushers in light and life. The Lord is not the source of evil or the cause of sin. Nothing happens without the Lord's knowledge and permission. He is the cause of well-being. He may inflict retribution but he may also permit calamity to come through human sinfulness, through Satan, or through the sin-corrupted order of the natural world. He lifts his protection and allows brokenness to come through. We know with the story of Job that he allows Satan to do it, and we know with the story of the chosen people Israel that when he wants to punish them, he lets them have their way, and they ultimately end up suffering for it. And they cry to him to be saved, and he does. I am the Lord who does all these things. But remember how this started? Our reading today, I am your Redeemer. Let's read about that a little bit. Whoops, I didn't want to do that. Let's try that again. So we'll go to Ephesians chapter 5, and we'll read 1 through 14. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, 
has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, so what did we have yesterday? <clears throat> All right, so there was some very specific guidance on how to conduct yourselves as Christians. You know, yes, this was definitely addressed to the church in Ephesus, but I think this is guidance that is timeless. Put off your old self, put on the new self, right? Don't, don't live like you used to live before you, before you knew Jesus, right? Don't be corrupted by deceitful desires, which lure you in with momentary pleasure and um, cause you to not do what is God-pleasing, right? <clears throat> so he has all this, you know, be angry, don't sin, don't let the sun go down on your anger, do honest, you know, if you're a thief, don't steal, do honest work, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, only that, only such as is good for building up, that it may give grace to those who hear, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind, right? Tenderhearted, forgiving. That is how to conduct yourself as a Christian. And now we get a little bit more of it, a little bit more explanation. In other words, be imitators of God as his beloved children. Beloved children please their parent, right? Their parents. God is our father. Imitate him. Right? Does God get angry? Yes. Righteously. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is an Old Testament reference. Okay. Um, sacrifices to God included incense and um, they wanted everything about that offering to be pleasing. So it was pleasing in appearance, pleasing in um, aroma, okay? <clears throat> Obviously, the, the incense would, uh, like we do in Vespers, right? Let the incense of our repented prayer ascend before you, O Lord, right? Smoke rises, you know, rises up to God. Christ loved us. How did he love us? By giving himself up for us, right? Thinking of us more than himself, but, so this is, this is what we're supposed to do, but here's what not to do. Sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints and shouldn't even be accused of it. Sexual immorality, impurity, covetousness. All right. Sexual immorality, of course, is the... One of the things that is the phrase that led to the creation of our denomination, right? There are people who would argue about what that actually means. Sexual immorality was a particular feature of Gentile life. See 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And it is connected to idol worship, pagan worship, okay? Uh, there were some gods and goddesses in pagan pantheons, they would call them, the the pagan belief systems that um, sex with people who are not your spouse, your, your married spouse was part of the worship. Okay. Um, that is not going to happen with Christians. We don't conduct ourselves like that, whether it's part of worship or otherwise. 
Okay. Marriage is between one man and one woman. And those activities are reserved for that marriage bed. That's it. So impurity, covetousness, um, covetousness, greedy is another word that says greedy for the neighbor neighbor's wife, right? Should not even be named among you. In other words, sin begins with words and those words often lead to deeds. So don't even talk about it. Don't even talk about it as is proper among the saints. So now it's, you know, um, you know, Jesus taught that sin begins in the heart. You know, he talked about two of the commandments. You shall not kill. But if you're angry at your brother, you're guilty of the same sin. You shall not commit adultery. But if you lust after someone who is not your wife or your husband, you are guilty of the same sin. Right. Begins in the heart. And the next phase is talking about it and then acting on it. So he's saying, don't let it get that far. And, and that's what the next verse is about. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place for a Christian. Instead, let there be thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Hmm. What do you think that word is? Let's just look, shall we? Eucharistia. I'm sorry, Eucharistia is the proper way to pronounce that. Eucharistia. Eucharist is where that word comes from. Eucharist comes from this word, thanksgiving. Not a coincidence, right? Don't, don't waste your words on this stuff. Be thankful. Obviously to God, but for all your blessings, wherever they come from, if it's from your neighbor, from your family, ultimately it's from, they're from God, right? For you may be sure of this, everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Hmm. Together, these terms, sexually immoral, covetous, and idolater, suggest temple prostitution, which is a common feature of pagan Gentile life. One who trusts God will be satisfied with the spouse God has given them. Okay. All right. Let no one deceive you with empty words. Empty words claims that such deeds will not be punished. And because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. And it takes us back to chapter 2, verse 2. Chapter 2, verse 2 says, if you don't recall, uh, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. That's verse 1. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Okay. This is a Hebrew expression for one's character. The Gentiles were disobedient unbelievers. By contrast, the sons of God have God's holy character. There you go. All right. <clears throat> now, sons of disobedience. Uh, therefore, do not become partners with them. Do not share in their sinful deeds, which would contradict our fellowship in Christ. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, right? How you walk is how you live. That's It's a metaphor, right? If you're going to walk with Christ, you're going to live in Christ-like way. If you're going to walk in darkness, you're going to live in a not Christ-like way. The fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. Fruit is a common New Testament image for good words and deeds that flow naturally from someone who is planted in Christ. Makes sense. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. What would Jesus do? Right? Discern there is literally test it. Test it by the standard of God's word. That is always a good test. What does the Bible say? Should we or shouldn't we? Does the Bible have anything to say about that? Usually it does. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Hmm. Expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things they do in secret. Hmm. 
Hmm. Now it takes us back to verse 3. Verse 3 is that covetousness and things that shouldn't even be named, right? These are the things they're doing in darkness, in secret, okay? Sexual immorality, impurity, covetousness. These things are being done in secret because they know they're not God-pleasing. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. Makes sense. Shine the light on. Light is the great um, disinfectant, right? Anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Okay. Um, God's word not only exposes evil, but can transform evil persons into good. Now, and he quotes this, right? All right, we have a couple of references here. Isaiah 51, 52, and 60. Uh, I think that's Malachi 4 and Romans 13, 11. All right. So we have here the source of Paul's quotation is perhaps a baptismal hymn. And um, that would make sense. He mentions verse 19, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, right? So that's probably what this is. <clears throat> when he says awake, death, even a sinner's spiritual death, is like sleep to God. Through baptism, Christ resurrected us. Um, that is a common um, phrase in the New Testament. Jesus and Paul both talk about death like it was sleep. Um, when uh, when Jesus raised the 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 one man's daughter, he he said to her, "Little girl." They said, "No, she's dead. What are you going to do?" He said, "She's not dead. She's sleeping." Little girl, get up, right? He he treats it as though it were sleep, um, because it is no harder for him to raise someone from the dead than it is to wake up a sleeping child. So. All right, that's enough. We will pick up there tomorrow with verse 15. Let's conclude our liturgy. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, our Lord and Savior, begotten before all ages, revealed himself to the world. Alleluia. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our Lord and Savior, begotten before all ages, revealed himself to the world. Alleluia. Let us pray. Whenever we try to face life with nothing but the strength that is ours, show us, O God, how poor it is and then share with us thine own down the ways of thy steady purpose. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we may not fall into sin, nor be overcome in adversity. And in all we do, 
direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now the Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. And that concludes our matins for this Wednesday. Thank you for spending this time in the Word with me. And thank you for giving back to God a little bit of the day He has given to you. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow, same time. So hope you can join me for that. Um, I hope you have a blessed Thursday, blessed Wednesday. <laughs> and until we can be together again, whenever that is, may God bless and keep you.